Can you make money from house and land packages? Hi, I'm Sam Powell. And I'm Joe Krause, and we are the host of the Property Pals Australia podcast. And in this episode, we're discussing what is an actual house and land package, what it looks like, what are the pros and the cons of buying one as an investor, and then the pros and cons of buying one as a homeowner as well. Yeah, and we talk about how people can easily be sold a house and land package by a selling agent and not know all the risks involved. Yeah, it's pretty pretty juicy combo. Um, you try to sell me a house and land package in this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> we also talk about that, what to be cautious of if buying a house and land package is you know, where we share examples of people that we know that have been taken advantage of buying house and land packages and not being disclosed all the information and not knowing those sort of hidden risks. Yeah, like there's, there's definitely there's a, um, strategies for house and land packages, there's pros and there's cons, so we want to sort of debunk them, give you all that information. Um, and we also discuss the examples of what a good house and land package is and what is not a good house and land package and uh, yeah, who you should buy, uh, where you should buy and, and why. So um, yeah, stick around and uh, hopefully you get a lot out of it. Yeah, before we get stuck in this episode, I also want to let you know that this podcast is not the only way we can help you for free. We do have our mini course on how to maximize your borrowing capacity. So to get that, head to propertypals.au forward slash resources and grab that tool. It's a superior tool to help you buy a superior asset and achieve a higher ROI from the investments that you do purchase. See you on the inside. Welcome to Property Pals, the podcast where we share everything around how to build a property portfolio from researching areas, financing, structuring, buying, selling, and reinvesting to live a life of financial independence. As a disclaimer, any information shared by myself, Jared, Sam, and the Property Pals team is strictly general and should not be taken as constituting professional advice. You should consider seeking independent legal financial and taxation advice from a qualified professional. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's dive in. Uh, house and land packages. House and land packages, yeah. What's a house and land package? Oh, I mean, I've learned a lot from you in house and land packages and Yes. Most most of what I've learned for about house and land packages have been from you, but also some examples of people that have bought house and land packages and their experiences. Mm. So I guess we'll t- we'll talk to those. But what is a house and land package? Yeah. Uh, well, house and land package is what it says. Uh, basically, <laughs> on a box. So you've got the land, well done, um, and then you've got a house that you put on top of the land, and they package it up to be a one you know total price. Uh, and these are those billboards, right? These are those billboards you typically see when you're driving somewhere and they're selling like a cheap house and land package and you're like, wow, that's good, but... Yeah, you get into this house for $399,000 and you're like, what? Yeah. I can't even build a house for three ninety nine. dollars mm-hmm. Well, they can, but caution required, hence the title of this podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of people, they start off their um, investing journey with you know, um, house and land packages. It's It's a... Pretty easy sell, um, so I want to run through the pros and the cons and give you a couple of examples through this episode. What do you mean it's an easy sell? Well, for a first-time investor, uh, is, is is this us going to be going through the pros? Yeah, let's go there. Okay. Yeah, so first, a, first-time yeah. investor, it's um, or even an uh, owner-occupier. Like, it, there's not a lot of stock on the market, especially now, that might light you up, right? So to get in the market might be hard. And what you want to buy, you probably can't afford. Yeah, or it might not be there. So you're there looking at established properties and then you see this, it's kind of like off the shelf um, purchasing where you're like, oh, wow, I can actually have that house. And look, that location is not the ideal location, but that house is is what I want. I want to create, you know, my my dream home or a home that I would really like. I, I want that kitchen. I want have that kind of bench top on these colors yada 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 sexy bathroom good mirrors yeah and then they vanity. and they come in on board and this is the the pros which is you know sell it to you like well with house and land packages jared instead of buying um a full property for eight hundred thousand dollars you have to pay stamp duty on eight hundred thousand dollars you can buy this land for three hundred thousand dollars so your stamp duty is only based off a three hundred thousand dollar purchase uh, so you're saving yourself probably 20 grand just off the battle 
on on stamp duty. Well done, you're a smart buyer. Next, <laughs> the easy deal access. We've got all these blocks of land you can choose from. Fantastic. Oh, you know, like dangerous. you can have north facing, you can have you know waterfront. You know, you just pick and choose. You know, as you go, you want a corner block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. That's easy, and there's not just there's not just one development project in any one location. There's usually a few going on. So, you know, you can go and pick and choose, you can weigh them up, and that lights you up. Next thing is, from the investment side, because it's a new asset, Jared, do you know you can claim depreciation on this property? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard of that, quantity, quantity surveyor. Yeah, you, you can yeah. say, you know, you, 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 you don't like paying tax. No one likes paying tax. Goddamn government screwing us all over. Well, guess what? If you buy this, it depreci- you can put twenty to thirty thousand dollars in your back pocket through depreciation in the first five years alone. Mm. Well done. Mm. And oh, the kicker is, guess what? Low maintenance builder guarantees. You know, you, you don't have the stress and the overwhelm of having a uh, a house that you have to constantly maintain. It's brand new. As well. Brand new. You know, Warranty. like. Warranty. And if anything happens, the builder's going to come in and they're going to fix it straight away for you. <laughs> I laugh at that because I call bullshit on it. Yeah. Um, getting a builder out to fix something they built six months ago is just a nightmare. Um, yeah. And that's kind of why we're having a laugh on it. Because they're not getting paid to go and do that job. They've, they got paid to do the job and now they have to go and back and fix it for no extra. The reason I'm having a bit of laugh is because you had to sell it to me. Me being me and learning a lot and knowing, knowing a bit about property now is like I'm not – most of those points for me, I'm like, I want the opposite. I'm happy to pay, you know, a higher stamp duty on a better asset. I'm happy to – easy deal access, like talking about supply and demand um, mm-hmm. of property. If there's – if I can get anything that I want, north-facing, south-facing, all that sort of stuff, means there's a lot of supply and not much demand. So I'm like, oh, that's not something I typically want. Uh, good depreciation. I don't care about the depreciation. Everything depreciates. Yeah, you can do a rental on an existing property and get depreciation out of that. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. And so then the low maintenance thing as well. Of like, well, if you just buy a good solid asset that's old. It's low maintenance too. But like, like you said, these are the stories that I've heard. Is people have bought properties uh, with contracts where they it's a struggle to get a painter out to fix up some spots. They struggle to get know anything changed or maintenance happening within that first year they just they just don't care they just literally don't care about you they sell the property and then you're you're just a number you've yeah. got your money they don't care anymore yeah. typically that's how i see it um and well, i've just knocked off every every pro just turned it into a bit of a con um, so you can tell that the house and land packages we're not stoked about. <laughs> no, and uh, I'm going to go through examples of both what's a good house and land package and what's a bad ha- um, house and land package. And I guess we should talk about who it's good for as well and who it's not so yeah. good for because there's different types of people that are, you know, house and land package might be good for like a some certain group of people. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, and I'm just dangling that carrot so you keep listening to our voices till the back end of the podcast. Yeah, I'm, le- I'm learning how this, this well works. Um, um, another little, a couple of pros on the um, house and land package side is there's a lot of government incentives, say first homeowner grants, um, builder grants, mm. to incentivize you. So this is kind of where we're leaning into some of the examples um, later on. Is you know those that are really struggling to actually save that deposit because you know the world is set up against you to save any money, um, they can use these grants to help them get into a home which. Uh, you know, is something that they own, and then they instead of paying rent, they're paying the mortgage. Um, so it's there is a pro around that. So you're actually using um, grants and other people's money. Like now, there's self managed super where you oh, sorry superannuation where you can put money into that and pull money out of your super and only pay that fifteen percent tax rate. So it helps you on your savings goal to get to that. Um, and then yeah, first homeowner grants and builder grants to one, the con on the builder grants side of thing is anything that they're giving to you for free, it always comes back, it's a part of a bigger plan, right? Like, so we'll give you these grants, but you only can buy, you only can do a brand new build. And for me, I'm like, well, you're not looking at the big picture. 
you're going to use that money to go buy a brand new home and build the home and then you're actually not going to have a, the better return on your investment over its lifetime based off historical evidence uh, to <laughs> you know to warrant it so you, you're taking that step forward to then take two steps back where you could just you know start at the right place and be more financially uh, abundant mm. as a result. So, so you're telling me that if I go and buy a house land package where I can go and get, I've got uh, easy access to deals so I can get any one in the lot because there's so many of them, are you saying that that's not going to grow because there's so much supply and not much demand? It's not going to grow as much as maybe buying in a Establish. higher growth location? Yep, yep. exactly. Supply yep. demand metrics is pretty simple with price growth. Um, there's a lot more elements to the data and analyzing which areas grow faster than others. But uh, out of all the areas that I'm analyzing in Australia, like they're not areas with high land supply, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> um, so let's get into, oh, they're the pros basically. So you get low stamp duty, easy access to deal flow, good depreciation, low maintenance, and you get your, your grants. So you don't, it's a lower cash requirement to get into the property market. So let's go through the grants again, because I think these, um, this is what most first homeowners do, is like, oh, I'm gonna buy my first property, uh, mm -hmm. how can I get some grants? Whereas sometimes that's that can be good, sometimes it's not so good. So what, what are these grants? You got first homeowners, and these change, I guess, as well. So mm -hmm. what have we got at the moment? Uh, okay, stop, timestamp. So, um, First homeowners get their, I think it's fifth. I don't specialize in the first homeowner sort of realm because they. Why not? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess there's a lot of education that goes into the first homeowners and um, you know, tend to, when it goes to paying for advice, they're not as welcoming on that because they look at that and go, well, instead of paying your fee, that takes away from my deposit, that ruins my. Um, Sorry, I'm confused around. The education and who you... Um, they're very green and... Who's they? The first homeowners. Oh, okay. Um, so like I was specialised in, you know, in investments and also uh, owner occupiers um, for good quality assets in certain locations. Yeah. Um, and my advice, you have to pay for it, my advice, obviously. So I guess educating people on, hey, you know you just saved $100,000 to buy your first dream home, I'm coming in going, well, in order for me to help you, I, I, I have to be paid for my time. I, the way we structure that is, you know, it's a fee-for-service model. We're gonna do the best thing for you, but it's quite difficult to get their head around um, the value proposition. Mm. And then with all the education out there um, and the savvy marketing campaigns, they get caught up in that and they end up going down a different path. And that's, Something that we're trying to break further into, to be fair. Like, I'm not a marketing person. I don't, um, I just know property and I know how it works. So, um, they're the people that need the most help, but they're the ones that tend to shy away from that help because, um, I don't know, it's like, this kind of sounds whatever, ego or ignorance in a way. So, they don't understand that, yes, you can go and buy a property yourself, but you don't, you've never done it. You don't know the complexities involved and you don't know what things are worth and even how to control the negotiation process with a sales agent. Well, yeah, it's a different mindset and I totally get it because when you are saving money, you're saving money and you want to do things on your own, off your own back because it's going to cost you less money. But if you're actually trying to achieve anything, my philosophy is pay premium, and pay the best people for the best advice that can shortcut your success and it will cost you uh, uh, yeah. on the upfront costs, but you'll get a far better ROI over time uh, versus you trying to do it all yourself and, you know, do it on the cheap. So yeah. that's 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 the mentality of, of savers, you know? And, yeah, and, and like, I get it because I was that person too. Yeah, <laughs> and the only reason why I say this is just because, yeah, time and time again, people just say, oh my God, I wish I had you on my last purchase. I wish I used yeah. it. I wish I knew all this knowledge before. At and the start of their journey. And it's like, yeah. it's, it's fine. It is, it's the journey you went to go on. That's why a big part of 
creating this podcast is to educate people and yeah. it's not just a big sales campaign because it's not for everyone there's multiple different ways it's not just a full buyer's agent service there's analysis and negotiation which is you know a fraction of the cost there's yeah. even just um, looking at it from an analytical point of view and giving you that heads up to be like hey um, don't pay over this amount for this property because you're it's just going to actually worth yeah it's, it's not worth so yeah anyway so it's yeah so we went out of a different route, which is which is good because uh, the the first homeowners grants and all those sort of things is um, it, it, if you're wanting to build wealth, typically they, from what I have found, typically they are not the assets that I want to buy that will actually help me build my wealth and my property portfolio are not the assets that allow me to use the grants. Yes. Yeah, the Typical. grants are an are in, incentive. Like, so the government grants, I said, go and build. We only give you the fifteen or twenty five thousand dollars in the builder's grant to build new. Mm. Uh, like, cool. Well, what if I don't want to live where those houses are being built? Then that just eradicates that. And then you, the first homeowners grant, you might get. Um, well, you get the stamp duty waiver at the moment. There's no um, first homeowners grant unless you're going to a new build. Mm-hmm. Whereas back in two thousand and eight, two thousand nine take note of those years they were actually giving grants for established properties as well and that is to fuel the property market to, to help grow it because the first homeowners 2008 2009 was after the gfc and yeah, yeah we needed we needed to help the economy grow so so our government gave some incentives in that block yeah so the um in, in the first homeowners psychologically they're the ones that are in that lower purchase price bracket so if you can boost that lower purchase price um those, those properties and that feeds into further confidence and then that sort of has a trickle on effect it's mm-hmm. kind of like um through uh the lockdown periods and covid there was a lot of incentives that got pushed out to people um, and then the whole idea was to put it in front of people who have high spending habits and then they go and spend the money and it filters through into the economy and it gets distributed what it gets distributed into is sort of the, the wealthy people who have the the know-how to actually extract that Profit out of the, the situation. So the person, Us, you and me, <laughs> the person who has the the um, I say like the person who gets the money up front, they spend it. They don't have it. I mean, their spending habits indicate that they can't create a savings plan. That's why they're forever in that hamster wheel that I call, and that's what we want you to get out of. So yeah. just be careful. Uh, towards the top end of property markets, you will start to see more and more grants coming out. That's an indica- indicator to me to sort of. Proceed with caution, and you know, um, then I'll switch my comments around. You know, where this future price growth is, and to ensure that you know you have that ability to hold these assets over a you know six plus year period, ideally ten plus. Yeah. So yeah. sorry, bit of bit of a rant there, but there's a lot. As you're probably listening to my voice, there's a lot of complexities behind market cycles, and um, that's what gives me the confidence to. Know, put people in the right direction and that's why i know my worth at, at the end of the day yeah markless so, market cycle series it's going to be coming okay for sure yeah we need we need to get that because yeah we we just you know sam and i before we even hit record on the podcast we we're talking about so many things and i'm like damn we just talked 40 minutes and we should have the microphone on <laughs> um so there's so much like that we talk about that is not yet said and we just want to package it up in a way that's consumable for you uh, at the right time and you going through the journey linearly through the podcast episode. So there's a pros, house and land packages. Yeah, they're the pros, house and land packages. The, what are the cons of buying a house and land package? <laughs> well, I guess we kind of touched on those too. Like, uh, as I said, there's good examples, so I'll touch on them, um, which are, is a good house and land package, which you can make good money from. Yeah. Um, but jumping into the cons, look, Low capital growth, and that's the supply risk that Jared talked about. Right? Like it's just a simple demand metrics. So if you've got heaps of land, um, then people have options. And if you're on the outskirts of a town, which generally house and land package developments are, mm-hmm. you know you go that next estate that's going to be built is going to be built next to yours, just a little bit further out, and then a little bit further out. It's the urban sprawl effect. Yeah. So when you're going to sell that property. Um, especially in the first few like ten years, people they'll they'll compare and go, well, I can buy a, that house which is built in two thousand and you know like five years ago mm. 
for eight hundred thousand dollars, or I can go and buy the land two minutes down the road and build my dream house for the same price, or maybe an extra seven hundred twenty grand or something. Oh yeah. Yeah, or even maybe a little bit less, depending on where it is. Um, yeah. And then they, they start to look at that. So that's the psychology you're competing against. And that's the supply issue. So I don't like to buy on the outskirts of town because you've got that risk. Just get on a Google map, search the location, zoom out, and hit a satellite view. Yeah. And, and then you're like, well, that's all farmland. Guess what happens to farmland over time? Gets developed, but very, very slowly. Yeah. The next thing is... Um, amenities right like so that's the that's the crazy thing that i think about is like if you get a if you get buy a house and land package whether you want to live in it like if you're investing or if you want to live in it the people that live you know in it whether you're renting or you're owning want the same thing you want access to shops and things like that but the reason these house and land packages are going so cheap is because they're, they're like no they're like 15 minute drive minimum to like coles and Woolworths and well, they have master plan things. communities, and then they they go. We're building a Woolworths here, yeah, and we're building a park, and we're building, um, you know, Ritz Carlton high rise deck mask, but um, <laughs> like heaps of parkland, and they do. They have that that plan in place, but um, if they're not getting the pre sales and they're not making the profit on the project, that just goes out the window. It's so not- you, so you're saying that there might be projections to put like a bank of shops with a Woolworths post office and all that sort of stuff around it. And then if the pre-sales don't happen with the, so the market is not buying those properties in that new estate, those house and land packages, are you saying that the smart guys that own the Woolworths and know they're not going to get the ROI from putting a Woolworths there anymore yeah. because there's not going to be as many people. So they pulled the deal well, and they don't build a Woolworths there. It might not be like the anchor tenant, which would be a Woolworths. They might say, well, we're not building because you don't have enough there. Yeah. Um, the plan would always be to have something like that, but that might, it might not be in it those change. two years. It might be 10 years in the track. Which is why the slow growth of those house and land packages is because you slowly need to get people filtering into those areas to warrant having more high end yeah, that's amenities and, nice. and shops. So they sell you on it too, like, oh yeah, buy in here. Look, there's a Woolies going in in you know um, next year. It's been approved. Yeah, cool. It's been approved. hasn't been, hasn't started construction. Yeah. When they start construction, then you know. Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit different. So um, just be be mindful of those things with yeah you know, yeah your amenities. You got to get in your car to go anywhere. There's no like public transport. It's difficult to um, to get to places. So mm-hmm. people tend to not really want to live there. It's more like a family generated. Sort of location, which is a heavy reliance on on cars and vehicles, and then um, yeah, that's also a, a cost as well. If you've got to drive that extra ten minutes out, that's twenty minutes each way. If you do that every single day, and there's costs involved in that as well. And I'm getting down to like the cents and everything, but yeah, but that's I mean that's not just cents. That's the more valuable uh, resource that you have, which is literally time and mm. time spent in the car when you know. For example, where I live, like the number one thing I like to do is go for a surf. It's close, it's you know. Across the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's it's yeah, that's 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 what people are thinking about as well. So yeah, what other cons have we got here? Long build times. So <laughs> during the lockdown um, C nineteen situation, um, gotta be careful <laughs> of what I say. Yes, uh, yes, be careful. <laughs> but. Um, you know, you saw contract times blow out. So people actually have bought house and land packages. And, and even like in, not in these environments, there's always delays with construction. You know, you've got so many moving parts. You've got, you know, you've got your concrete, you've got your builders, you've got your, all your other tradies. Mm-hmm. Um, then you've got the material supply as well. So it might be a six month build, but it might be pushed out to, you know, nine months. And then you're sitting there trying to plan your life and you're like, well, I'm renting and I'm trying to move in. Completion date is supposed to be this time and then it gets close to that time and you're so far away and they're like far out like what are we going to do and then say the owner of the property you're renting from is wants to sell it and then you've got nowhere to live it's stressful i'd love to know the stats on how many house and land packages and build times are actually accurate versus Mm -hmm. non-accurate because i mean i've heard that most people that have bought a house and land package like and even my parents bought a brand new unit off the plan really good option for them 
and it was, it wasn't a financial decision because they're, you know, downsizing and, you know, all the kids are out of home. But through that time, they bought this package and they bought that brand new off the plan. And when it was supposed to be ready, it wasn't ready. So they had to move in with family. And it was just like not an ideal situation for everyone because the, the property should have been ready. Mm. Uh, and it's so common. Like I think everybody listening probably knows somebody that has had that happen to. Yeah. So just be mindful of that. Um, and obviously go in with a contingency plan with your time, with the build times. Uh, mm -hmm. The next thing is uncertainty on build quality and yeah, I guess completion, right? <sighs> so touchy subject, but yeah. it is, it's a lot more prevalent um, now, uh, which is a shame, but like builders are pushed to you know, such fine margins and such short time frames. Yeah, short, short, short time frame. So, I mean, there's some really good people on like building um, approval inspectors and things like that on some social media. And like, you see some of the stuff that's being built, like it all looks lovely, but once you get up onto the roof and then you start living in it, you know, it hasn't been stress tested from the weather conditions. Like they build it to what they feel is you know, up to code and someone might've ticked it off, but cheapest they can do, but up to code at the same time in the fastest possible time. Yeah. And you Cause they're, they're, when you, when you think about a developer, what's their goal? Profit. Money. Right? So that's exactly what they're thinking about. So why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they do that? Mm. Yeah, you're, you're more your master builders and your good quality builders. They're the ones that are knocking down the established work for owner occupiers. Their, their name means a lot to them and they don't specialise in all those specky homes that just go up in house and land package regions. Uh, but yeah, and it's unfortunate because that's the I mean, leads into that that thing we'll talk about um, earlier, which is if you do have a water leak, you know that is stressful. But one, it creates mold, and then you got to live through it, and then two, you got to try and find someone to come and fix it. The insurance company like they they won't be involved. It's the builder that's, that has that seven year warranty on it, mm -hmm. and then you also got to look at like it's a classic example: builders fault default and they fail and they they might shut down one company and then go start another company yeah so you can't hold them responsible because maybe they have finished your building and when the building has finished and closed they might have you know shut down the company so to hold them responsible to pay out any insurance claims and whatnot and maintenance and stuff they're just like yeah no no worries we're, we're on to the next one they don't care so that's a that's a risk there's, yeah, and it's, it's going, one of the, one of the big builder, a, a friend of mine actually um, works for, she's a super lovely uh, lady. She doesn't know, um, I guess, maybe what's going on uh, when she was telling me the story and what they're actually doing is changing the company names. One, um, they're pushing existing employees to the new company structure. What that does is they become a new employee of that company, so therefore they don't have all the um, I guess those entitlements under that new banner because it's essentially it's a new job so you don't have those uh like if they were to make people redundant it's um they don't have to pay those high redundancy payouts because essentially they only just started the job three oh. months ago scary but they're still trading under like it's the same directors same same names it might just be like a, a shift from like xyz homes ptyz to xyz australia homes pty ltd mm -hmm. and then if people come through and they claim and they go, oh, look, this the build quality is poor. It's like, oh, that that's that's the old X Y Z homes. Um, we no longer we're not associated with them. We've we've taken out the business, and therefore we're not financially liable to fix those mistakes. It's it's really scary. So just go in with eyes wide open. Make sure that those builders um, are well established, and that, you know there's no change in names or shifting from another builder name to another and even from the trades point of view as well um, yeah yeah that's I, I just struggle to see why I think long term if you're a developer why would you not build a really good name for yourself like these guys are thinking so short term these developers they want money and they want it fast but I think they're still thinking short term in terms of like if I built say um, Kraus Construction, uh, and it was a development firm. 
I would want to sell the best house and land packages that do actually have high growth in like a certain location with close to amenities and stuff like that with great quality builds and give awesome maintenance and really good handover and insurances to the owners so they love it. So people purchase it as an investment and then they want to buy more. So then I have a wait list for the next building I build of people with money that that has grown. I've helped them build their wealth through that first house and land package that they're like, I've got equity in this. I need to go and reinvest it into another one that they do because it's worked so well. Why would developers not do that and have put their thinking hat on to build a good quality construction company for the long term? Maybe we get, maybe we do this Sam, but no, I, I, I urge somebody else to do it because I don't want to go through the hassle of it. But like you can, you can get so much more value from working with less people and you can make so much more money, not just for yourself, but everybody else if you do it the right way as a developer. Yeah, there's, there's definitely people like builders and developers out there like that. Oh, great. Um, few and far between. It just It's just the demand, right? Like you're like, oh, I'll build this great quality house. You know, it's, you know, is it, here's all our track record, but it's $400,000 for the build. And this person who's struggling and they just want a home, they're looking at the $250,000 build going, well, I can save 150 grand. I still got a house. It looks kind of the same. And because most people buy a property in Australia every 11 years, mm. you know, there's just such a, a change in the market conditions over time that, and they forget what it was like. They might not even remember who built the house 11 years ago. Yeah. So that's obviously the, the issue that, um, reason why people don't do what you want to do but uh there's definitely a demand for it and there's people out there hunting for good quality builders and there's actually strategies where people go and they just work with a certain builder who they know like and trust and they knock down established old dwellings and build brand new ones yeah um, so yeah strategies within strategies yeah so there's a few cons there we've got a few more to get through though so that's construction and yeah, so, so of, a classic one that I've seen, I used to do a lot of valuing of these house and land packages and you'd see the properties, one would be complete and it's like, wow, fantastic, that's complete. Um, you're all excited, you get a tenant in there, but then you're leasing it and no one's moving in, you're wondering why. And it's because next door is halfway through construction or and the, the properties all around it are vacant. No renter really wants to be, you know, you're moving nowhere. into a home where you've got the 7 a.m. time frame of someone just putting a drop saw down to wake everyone up. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's a detracting factor from a renter's point of view. Even a home, even a homeowner, like mm. you, yeah, you ideally want everything. Yeah, and that leads into the other factor, which is you know, the, it's a high rental supply. If you're buying into one of these house and land packages locations as an investor. There's going to be other investors in there too, so and they're all focusing in that market with that same strategy. Then you're going to have a higher supply rental supply issue, which is going to you're going to have a higher supply of um, places to rent. Yeah, so people which renters, decreases the amount that people would want to pay for rent because there's so much supply. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So think about those ones too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then then you go into. This is the thing we already talked about, like developer incentives and guarantees and stuff like that, like the not taking on responsibility through changing companies, right? Um, oh, well, I was, the next point, which is the final point, is um, yeah, you get these developers going, oh, that's okay, we'll do a rental guarantee. So from the day we finish completion, we yeah. will guarantee that you get six fifty a week rent out of this property, um, and they do that to, I guess, objection handle that whole issue. Yeah. When someone's in offering you an incentive to do something, stop, think about why. Nine times out of ten, the incentive's there for their best interest, not yours. So just like most places that do have those rental incentives historically have performed really poorly. So those rental incentives, you're just giving the say they guarantee that you'll get six hundred dollars a week rent. Mm. Uh, if you don't, what happens then? They pay it. Or they pay the rent. Yeah, okay. so for the first 12 months, we'll pay 600 bucks a week rent if, if you don't have a tenant in there. So then it's worth thinking about, all right, after 12 months, they they might pay, they might have to pay out 600, but the market value of it is $500 a week. And yeah. then you have to go down from $600 a week rent to $500 a week rent, which may not actually make your, if it is a property investment, uh, it may not actually make your 
property and actual, what do you call it, like uh, cost of the gear. Yeah. 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 Uh, that extra hundred bucks a week could be that tipping point into your stress levels to you put your hands up and go, stop it, sell it. And then you go sell it and you realize, hang on, this hasn't really grown much in value over the last 12 months. And after everything I've gone through, I now need to sell this thing. And you, that's how the negative equity starts to, to happen. That's a big issue is that people, are, you know, they're, they're forced sellers and they've got a $500,000 debt on this property. All the equity that they put into it, all the grants and um, cash they put in has been eroded. And now they're basically just gone through that whole experience, haven't made any money, and now back into where they were probably three years ago, which is renting. Yeah, so they're trying to invest to make money and there's so much supply of those rental units that, and there's not much, uh, there's so much supply of rentals and also houses, so the growth of the property's not growing. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so then let's talk about who this is good for. You know, let's talk about some examples of like, who is a house and package for? Yeah, so there's um, it's all location based for me. So if you can, yes, there's boutique estates that do house and land packages. There might be a hundred lots in a, in that subdivision, even down to like 10, 20 lots. Mm. Um, there, your supply is low, right? Yeah, so, it's ten to twenty, which is really cool. So if you can find little like little developments, um, they're actually not a bad uh, little play um, yeah. in growth locations throughout Australia, basically CBDs are really good to try and find um, and, and buy in, but yeah, look around, look at the surrounding development potential of other areas. Mm. So that way you're reducing that supply risk, which is gonna increase your capital growth over the time. And you also get the depreciation, the benefits of a new property. Mm. Um, just be mindful of who's building them. They tend to do sell for premiums because um, you know, it is attractive, uh, people can, and buy the land, do the development, they get all those benefits. So yeah. it, it's just those as an investment play, because they're like, for me to tick those boxes, they're in those inner city locations, the purchase prices are higher. Just, yeah. So. yeah, because you get, but they're higher because you're gonna get higher growth because of the location, but also rent as well. As the property grows in value, you're gonna get higher rental yields too. So. You might pay a little bit more at the start, but you're going to get the ROI over the long term versus what maybe a not so good house and land package for investor is somewhere in the sticks that's 20 minutes, 30 minutes drive away from your friends and family and good amenities. And um, there's so much that, you know, they're building maybe 200 homes or 100, 2,000 homes. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a lot of land as well, a lot of land supply around that where other developers can come in and build another 2,000 homes. Uh, so that might be not the best house and land package for an investor, but maybe for somebody who's like, I just want to live in a nice new home and I want to have space and I want it to be quiet and I want like a quiet neighborhood and I'm happy to drive 15, 20 minutes to the shops each day um, for living in a really nice home that doesn't cost me too much in mortgage repayments. Maybe that's a good option for some people. Yeah, I mean, but it's not as an investment property. As, as an investment, you, we get some investors who you know have really high incomes. So you're looking at it's like 300 plus and they, the tax depreciation benefits they get out of it are strong. They can afford the million dollar plus price tag on a um, new house and land package. Um, so, that can be a, a decent strategy as long as it's you know, pitted off with other investments in their portfolio. It's um, it's not a bad option. Um, then you get sort of duplex pair players as well, which you know, there's strategies around you know, getting the two, selling off the one, and then getting good depreciation out of that one. It's just it really comes down to location with um, yeah good examples of house and land packages and. 99% of the locations where you'll find a house and land package are rubbish. So just um, do your research and reach out if you have any questions. So somebody that is thinking about buying a house and land package as an investment, we've been through pros and cons of them, but what would be you know your short list to DD, due diligence and research on what they should be looking for um, before they decide to buy a house and land package, other than chatting to us? <laughs> um, do your location research, try and find those growth locations that um, you know, in Australia, that those suburbs are actually showing good signs of you know, capital growth, and that means that there's low supply, 
high rental demand, um, you know, low vacancy rates, short times on market, no future supply coming on board, um, you know, good, obviously, infrastructure that's surrounding it and it's a growing location. Um, start there, so the location research primary, and then if you're looking at that house and land package, making sure that there's you know, limited lots being available. So I like to say no more than 100, uh, 100 lots to you know, in invest in. Um, they're kind of the, where I'd start. Then you go further into, well, what's the, oh, you got the developer, but you know, that'd also be in cahoots with, with builders and making sure that the build builder that's doing the build has a good track record. You can go through and analyze their businesses, how long they've been trading for is a good thing. Go and check on um, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission website. Just do your DD on them and ask them as many questions. Try and find referrals. Look at also past projects that they've done and go through and see well, how they performed um, over the last 10 years. I uh, love that. That's probably some keys that I'd um, yeah, hit on. Yeah. Examples of you know poor house and land packages, you no doubt you probably figured it out by now, but on the outskirts of towns, um, low, I guess, data pointing to growth um, amenities. So there's looking at you know, high supplies coming on board. You've got vacancy rates over three percent. If you've got you know um, a lot of like surrounding farmland or in infill land that can be developed to increase that supply over the next ten years, just don't touch that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. There you go, guys. Beware of house and land packages unless you are going to do your DD and find one that looks good. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons in that. Everybody that is listening, thank you for listening. We don't typically ask people to subscribe or leave a review, but why not? Like, please, if you are getting value from this, like, subscribe, yeah, leave don't a review. Ask that yeah, and sh leave a review and let us know, like, what you like about it, and we can do more of that. Yeah, and then. Hit us up with any questions, probably yeah. at or AU. Yeah, got some good, good feedback. Um, love the good feedback. It's obviously motivating, uh, but like, I'm also open to uh, not so good feedback. Like, there's no such thing as perfection in an imperfect world. feedback, yeah. I like it. Um, but yeah, we're here to help um, and you know, all grow together. So thanks for listening and, and keep, in, keep involved, keep in the family. Chat soon. See ya.